<clears throat> um, first of all, good job to everybody tonight, Yud Kislev. Uh, the day the Mittal Rebbe, Dalt Rebbe, son was released from prison. <clears throat> um, we're going to learn Allah and Tanya. We'll see about what happens at the end. I don't know yet. Anyway, last time we were learning in Halacha, the Midas, the characteristic attributes that people should behave when we're learning about anger and haughtiness and not to want, uh, like it says, kinov, ataiva, vakovid. The last thing we learned was what the Mishnah brings down in Pekiovis, jealousy, lust, and wanting honor uh, destroy the person from the world. Why? Because if, you, you, if you're jealous of everybody and all your lust is everything and you can't get everything <clears throat> and you want everybody to honor you and you don't get the honor you really think you deserve, so it makes you crazy. You're not living a normal life. Okay, so now in, in Halacha it says, okay, maybe we should go to the opposite extreme. Maybe we should... <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I won't eat meat, I won't drink wine, I won't get married, I won't have a nice house, I won't wear nice clothing. Maybe I should just become a, a hermit and separate myself from the world. So it says that's also not a proper way of doing it. And in fact, it's forbidden for a Jew to live in that lifestyle. And in fact, it says, and even then, Halacha says you are called a sinner. Why are you called a sinner? Because we find there's somebody called a Nazir, a Nazirite. A Nazirite was one who wants to become holy, and he makes a vow, basically, he won't drink wine, he won't cut his hair, he won't become impure to dead bodies. He's a Nazir. So the, the halach is, the Torah says when he's finished, the duration of how long he was a Nazir, a regular Nazir is 30 days. Let's say somebody says, okay, I'll be a Nazir for, for three months. At the end of the three months, he has to bring, it does a process. He has to go cut his hair. He has to bring certain sacrifices. What are the sacrifices the Nazir brings, the Nazarite brings, is a sin offering. Karm Chatos, a sin offering. And Yerushalmi, Talmud Yerushalmi asked the question, brought down in Babli and is brought down in Allah also. Yeah, what type of sinner is he? He's a holy man. He made no wine and no cutting hair. And he was another, it's Kedish. The Torah calls him a holy man. <clears throat> and the Gemara answers, <clears throat> excuse me, Dayach Masha Sarto Lecho It's enough what the Torah forbids you. In other words, in using our regular language, don't be more religious than the book. Don't be more religious than the Torah. The Torah says you're allowed to drink wine. You're allowed to cut your hair. You're allowed to, unless you are Kohen, you can come in contact with a dead body. The Torah says, don't be more religious than the book. And therefore, this Nazir that wanted to be holier than thou, he finished his Naziris, he has to bring a sin offering. What is the sin? That he acted more to the right and more religious than the book says. And from there, the halacha shows that a person who goes above and beyond what the law halacha tells us to do, is in essence called a sinner. Now, the only time, sometimes, we learn a person has to be an extremist. For instance, if a person is a wine addict, and he, the only way he can get out of it is by making a vow to be a nazir today, you shouldn't do it, by the way. It's a big problem with a nazir today. You shouldn't get, ever make that vow that you're going to be a nazir. But if you know the person is overly indulged in eating meat and he wants to make a vow that he'll not eat meat, why? Not because he wants to be more religious than the Torah. He just wants to get back to normal. So then it's a good thing. But not on the regular way, you don't be more religious than the Torah. In fact, there's a very interesting halacha that the poskim discuss. And that is, to give you an example, we know that if meat falls into milk, or trait, non-kosher, falls into kosher, it's nullified one in 60. That's the halacha. If one, one ounce of milk falls into 65 ounces of uh, meat, so then it becomes nullified and it's all kosher. You can eat it. So now the question is, what is a person allowed to say, you know what? 
I know Torah allows it. I don't want to eat it. I, I want to be more strict. I don't want to eat. Yes, the Torah says I can eat it. And I don't want to eat it because I want to be more from. So some opinions, by the way, say you're allowed to. You're allowed to be. You could. And most opinions, most opinions, by the way, say you're not allowed to do it. Why? Because by doing it, you're basically saying, oh, I don't agree with the Torah. Torah says it's kosher. No, but I'm going to be more strict than the Torah. So that's also forbidden. So basically, under normal circumstances, a person should not be a fanatic. Only, like we said, in anger and haughtiness and those types of things. But in lifestyle, yes, a person should not, like we said many times, live to eat. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't eat. And as we know, especially in the Hasidic world, the Rebbe was adamantly against people fasting because it's not the healthy way of living. It's not the proper way of being able to, to serve Hashem properly. And therefore, it's forbidden. So this is a thing the person really has to understand uh, that's actually forbidden. Another important thing, if I were discussing this in Shul tonight, it says you should never fight over doing a mitzvah. Don't fight over doing a mitzvah. For instance, he says to lead the services, to be the chazan. Never fight over it. And they bring an example from the Gemara. There was what was called the lechem hapanim, the showbread that was on the table, the shulchan in the Mishkan. And every Shabbos, they would divide it up. There were 12 chalas. Six chalas they gave to the shift of Kohanim leaving. Six chalas to the next shift coming. There were weekly shifts of the Kohanim in the base of Migdash. So it says there were six loaves and there were a lot of Kohanim on the shift. So a lot of Kohanim would fight, grab it, fight it, to grab it and to take it. And the Gemara says the Tznuyim, the more refined Kayanim, they didn't grab, they didn't take it. They didn't want to be fighting with other people over a mitzvah. And we're me mentioning this tonight in Shul. Yeah, let's say a person has yard site, okay? Anniversary of death of somebody in the family, he wants to be the chazan, wants to die for the omnibus. But it becomes a fight because of it. So Allah says, and, and this is people don't realize this because they don't think straight. You are why why do you want to daven for the Amit? Why do you want to lead the services? Because it's beneficial for the deceased. Fighting over it is worse for the deceased than the davening for the Amit, than for the Bida Chazan, or to say Kaddish, or to get an Aliyah. You want to get an aliyah before your side because it's the proper thing to do out of respect to the deceased. Torah comes along and says, you're going to fight over it. It's a bigger degrading of the deceased than getting the aliyah. So people have to know with their priorities of, you know, well, you don't fight. And there are lochic guidelines in these things. Who comes first? Who has the right to be the chazan first, the second and third? And aliyah is the same thing. It has a lot of Aloha guidelines are chapters and chapters in Aloha that discuss, you know, who gets what, what priority, who gets the priority, and so on and so forth in that. Another thing is like this. The first day of the Shukhan Aruch we said is to be bold like a leopard. Askanemer means, like the Dalt Rebbe says what it means in Shukhan Aruch, the beginning of Shukhan Aruch, not to be embarrassed for the scoffers, for the people that want to make fun of you of keeping Torah and mitzvahs. But it says, when it says bold like a leopard, which actually means the tendency of chutzpah, Halach has said it's not a good trait to have. Once in a while, chutzpah in, in halacha, in Torah, to stand up for Torah is good. But it says you shouldn't acquire the trait of chutzpah within you, because then you'll use it for the wrong purposes and chutzpah itself, I know it's a Jewish trait, but chutzpah itself is not a proper trait. Only when it's used correctly and, you know, when it needs to be used. There's another din over here that I wanted to talk about that the Poskim in, in Kitsa doesn't talk about it, 
but the Paskum talk about it, and I'm sure this is something that people never even dreamt about is an issue. Or that is um, using non Jewish dates in documents. Using the secular date, which means which means as follows. We have the Jewish calendar. Today was the 9th of Kislev. Tomorrow is the 10th of Kislev. In the secular calendar, today was the 25th of December, and tomorrow is the 26th, I'm sorry, November. And tomorrow is the 26th of November. So there's a question in Aloha. If I'm writing a check, I'm writing a legal document, or I'm writing a letter to you, I'm writing you a letter. Am I allowed to put the non-Jewish date on it? And there are opinions, by the way, that hold you're not allowed to, believe it or not. Why? Why? Because the secular calendar is based on the Christian calendar of Yashkia. When you have, now we're in 2020, 2020, what's the, the number 2020 coming from? It's not from creation of the world. It's coming from, from, from the time of Yashkia. So many poskim hold that there's a Pasuk in Chomish that says, Shem elokim acherim leisaskiru aponai. Hashem says, you shouldn't mention the name of foreign gods as long as I'm alive, God says. And there are opinions in Allah that say, you're not allowed to do it. It's interesting. The Rebbe has letters, and, and I'll take it even a step further. Some opinions that are lenient about that say there's a bigger question. Today, you have to write, if you write a check or a document today, you'll write November 25th. 2020. Sometimes you write it for short. 11 25 20. Okay, so what does that mean? 11th, um, 11th month, 25th day of the year 2020. So they say that's even worse. Why is that worse? Because the Torah says Nissan is the first month. Torah says, the year Nisan is the month of Nisan is the first of the months. Now you're going English by, by, the, by November and you're writing 11 or 12 for December, one for January. You're basically saying, what's the first month? January. What's the second month? February. When Torah says the first month is Nisan, the second month is the year. So there are opinions that hold, by the way, you're not allowed to. Thank God. Thank God. There's a lot of other opinions, including the Rebbe, that hold you allowed to do it. It's not a problem. The bigger problem, and I don't want to get into it, even now there's a leniency about that, of putting a non-Jewish date on a monumental stone by a cemetery. But that's uh, even that people today permit it. But the Rebbe brings down Many, many opinions. In fact, in fact, the Rebbe brings down a book, Kobal and Avelis, that gathered a lot of the opinions about it. And they say that we find that Rama, who was the sidekick of the Beisos and Shechon has a tshuva where he wrote the Goyesh date, the Chsam Sefer, Rabbi Kiva Eger. Many, many people wrote, many great, 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 great holy tzaddikim did write the Goyesh date. The Rebbe even quotes the Pasik and Tilim. Hashem yisper b'chseiv amim. Hashem counts in the in the writing of the goyim. So they write like this. Today, when people write January, February, November, they're not having anything with Yoshka in mind. This is what everybody writes. Everybody writes it. They're not having anything to do with the, with Yoshka, with the, the Gregorian calendar or the 2020 AD or BC or whatever it may be. 
So bottom line, Allah, you find people, by the way, people today that are still machmer in this, especially they won't write 11, they will definitely not write 11, 25, 20. They might be right November 25th, 2020, but they won't write 11, 25, 20. But la halacha, there's no problem doing it. You're allowed to do it. And there's, again, there's a letter from the Rebbe about it. There's no uh, problem with it at all. Okay? That's some an interesting thing that uh, people are not even aware that they should be aware of it. Okay? Now, there's also another thing about people making um, a shvua, making vows. And it says like this, many times, and this is interesting by the Sephardic Jews, it's much more common than Ashkenazic Jews. They swear on the mother's life, they swear on the kid's life, they swear on this life. Halacha says it shouldn't be done. I mean, generally speaking, a person should not swear. You should never swear. I swear I'm going to do this. I swear I'm going to do this. A Jew always says, I will try Blinada to do it. I'll try Blinada to do it. But the person should never swear. I swear it's against the Torah. In fact, Dal Rebbe also brings this down because Yanai HaMelech had a thousand cities. The king down had a thousand cities and they were all destroyed because people in his time would swear a lot. So you don't swear. And you definitely don't swear by God's name, which is a negative commandment if you're not doing it for holy things. And you definitely shouldn't be just using the word swear. You could say, I promise, lean other. And generally speaking, a Jew, there's a passage that says, what comes out of your mouth, you should keep. Which means, even if I don't swear, if a person says, I'm going to do something, there's a biblical obligation to do it. In Shulchan Aruch, it says, a proper way, more uh, a religious person, even if you thought you're going to do something, not bad, God forbid. If I thought I was going to do something, the proper thing is to do it. It's not only by tzedakah, by the way. By tzedakah, according to many opinions, if you verbalize it, you have to give it. It's a vow. Just saying, I'll give X amount of money to tzedakah. And Allah says, even thinking about it, the right thing to do is give that money to tzedakah that you thought about. But regardless, there are there's an Indian of not... Um, what a person says, they should keep. So therefore, unless you say blineder, that's why a person should always say, I will blineder try to do something. The Mendel Futafas, the renowned chassid, or Mendel Futafas, a very great chassid, a Russian who lived in Siberia for many, many years, he used to come every year to Los Angeles after Tishrei and he would go collect money. And he used to call me Shuster. That's what he called me, Shuster. He used to speak to me in Yiddish, but he called me Shuster. So he once asked me, he said, Shuster, he told me in Yiddish, he wants me to go help him raise some money for his thing. So I said to him, Ramendel, in Yiddish, I told him, I'll try. He said to me, Shuster, that's the American bluff. I'll try. He says, I'll try in America means, no, I'm not going to help you, but you want to be nice, so you lie and you say, I'll try. And he told me off for saying, I'll try. You want to do something good, you don't say, I'll try. But people should be careful with swearing, promising, especially if you're not going to keep it. Um, it, it it's a big halakha question of, of not doing that. Okay, next. Um, there's a din in, in Shukhun Aruch over here that the nature of people is to be drawn after their environment. People are drawn after the environment. That's human nature. Therefore, it says in Allah, you have to connect. You should connect to tzaddikim. You should always be connected to tzaddikim. 
learn, learn from them to lo- know how they live. Uh, in fact, the Rambam says, if you live in a neighborhood or a city where the people and the leaders are bad and people don't act properly, you should go to a different city. <laughs> There's one problem with that today. There's nowhere in the world to go to because they're all corrupt and they're all, they're all no good. And uh, whatever you go, you're not going to be good. But a person really, no, there's no joke. A person is affected by the people they hang around. And therefore, it's very important for parents. You know, when kids are older, it's hard to control it. But when parents uh, have little children, they have to make sure that the children's friends and the families of their children's friends are proper people. You have to make sure they're proper people because otherwise you get influenced by them. And we know it's brought down. If you walk into, Halacha says this, if you walk into a perfume store, even if you didn't put any perfume on you, you walk out of the store, you still smell from perfume. If you don't smoke, but you walk into a, a, a room which is full of smokers, Okay, today you're not supposed to do that. But if you have a room full of smokers, so what happens? You end up smelling from smoke. I, you didn't put, you didn't smoke. But the environment has a tremendous effect halachically on the person. And therefore, according to halacha, a person, if you live in a bad city with bad people, in fact, one of the negative aspects of light why he chose to live in Zdaim when he separated himself from Avram was because Zdaim were people were very bad. Okay? So therefore, one din is you have to hang around Sadiqim. The next din is you have to cling to Sadiqim. And this is based on the Pasuk and Chumash. Hashem says, Uvay Sidbak, you should cling to Hashem. Maris, how can you cling to Hashem? Hashem is not tangible. How is it possible to cling to Hashem? And the Gemara answers, he dovek cling to scholars. Because scholars are connected to Hashem and by connecting to a scholar. So it says in for instance, in Halacha, what should you do? You should marry the daughter of a Talmud Chacham. You should marry off your daughter to a Talmud Chacham. You should eat and drink with scholars. You should do business with scholars. Why? Because then you learn from their behavior. If it's a real scholar. There's a Pasuk that says, uh, basically the Gemara learns from the Pasuk that it means if your teacher is like a Malach Hashem, he's a holy person, learn from him. And if he's not a holy person, you don't learn from him. In fact, the Gemara tells a story. Rameir, the famous Rameir of the Gemara, was a student of Elisha ben Avuyo, who became the heretic, the Acher, as he was called, who became a total non-believer, desecrated Chabas and everything. And Rameir still continued learning from him. Rameir continued learning from him. And the sages said to him, how can you learn from this person? He's not a tzaddik, he's a Russia now. And he's not a Russia out of ignorance. He's a Russia because he turned against our mitzvahs. Why are you learning from him? And Rameir answered, and this is only for good for Rameir. Rameir answered his friends, I am great enough. I know how to eat the fruit and spit out the pits. Meaning, Rameir said, I know how to take the good and separate the bad. But none of us are able to do that. If you learn from a person who's not moral, who's not ethical, who's not the proper good person, then you're going to learn something from them. And if not from what they teach you, from their behavior. So therefore, it's very important, Halacha says, to learn from proper people, to live around proper people, to uh, cling to proper people, because that's the way you end up cleaning, clinging to Hashem. Okay, next thing, we'll just start a little bit. This is a very, uh, it's called the golden rule. But it's not such a it's not such a simple uh, halacha to be. It says an halacha like this: you have to love every single Jew. 
Vavta Reacha Kamecha. Okay, Rabbi Kiva said it's the uh, entire Tatum. There's a whole question in Halacha if that includes a non Jew also. Are they called your friend? Uh, many opinions hold yes, they are still creations of Hashem. So, yes, they're not Jewish, but they're still creations of Hashem. And therefore, you should love them because they're Hashem's creation. But here there's a very interesting halachic dispute where we know Chabad has a, a very clear, clear cut view based on Shulchan Aruch and the way, especially the way the Altarev explains it in Tanya. And that is as follows. The Shaila in Allah is, do I have to, am I allowed to hate people that are not religious? Am I allowed to hate people that are not religious? So, many opinions say, um, here, say it like this. Um, this is okay. In Allah it says, some people say that a person that doesn't keep Torah mitzvahs, it's a mitzvah to hate them. Unless if they do tshuva. Okay? Now, first of all, that's very wrong attitude, especially in today's world. It's wrong halachically, and it, but there are opinions in halacha that say that, by the way. A person who's not religious, there's a mitzvah to hate him. Because he doesn't, doesn't keep their mitzvahs. The Altareb explains in Tanya that even a person who's very bad, where the Gemara says, mitzvah that it's a mitzvah to hate him, Without that, and this is very profound. Even that poskim in halacha bring down this paraklamid base of Tanya that the Alter Rebbe says. The Alter Rebbe says, even though the Gemara says it's a mitzvah to hate him, at the same time there's a mitzvah to love him. And the Alter Rebbe explains what does this mean. And this is brought down in halacha, by the way, what the Alter Rebbe says. And that is, I hate the bad that they do, but I love the person. In other words, the mitzvah of Yohavta doesn't mean I love whatever they do. Yohavta Leyacha Kamecha means I love the person. I hate what they do. And this you see by parents and children. Parents love the children unconditionally. But when a kid does something wrong, the parents hate it. They don't hate the kid. They hate what the child does. At the same time, they love the child. And, and to, to be continued, because they tell you I want to go to Tanya, but the point is that even people that are not religious, even today we'll learn next week, today for sure it doesn't apply. But I'm talking even people that know, they're not what's called Tinek Shanishba. They're not people that were captured and raised unreligious, irreligiously. People that were raised Jewish and, and turn away from Yiddishkeit, where the Gemara says it's a mitzvah to hate him, but at the same time there's a mitzvah to love him. What do you hate? Not the person. Halacha says, you hate what they do, but you love the person. Okay, we're going to go to Tanya. I uh, mentioned before the class started, tonight's class is sponsored by Moshe Mataban. He has Yartzeh for his father, Rabbi Alisha ben Yosef, who's uh, Yartzeh to view the Kislev tonight and tomorrow, the Nisham Shinav and Aliyah. Amen. Advocate.